What has been accomplished uh, with these four summits? Uh, how far along the road are we towards security and safety, would you say? Well, there have been um, many tangible accomplishments. Uh, a dozen states or so have gotten rid of all their weapons usable material. Um, there have been literally dozens of other individual contributions that have been announced. But at the same time, um, much remains to be done. There's been modest progress over the last two years on improving security, but unfortunately, we've also seen fairly significant increases in the terrorist capabilities. In what ways, would you say? So, um, we've seen a nuclear terrorism threat in the past from Om Shinrikyo, um, the Japanese group, from Al Qaeda, and from Chechen, Chechen terrorists. The growth of ISIS is different. Um, ISIS actually controls more territory, has more resources, and more access to expertise than any of the previous groups. Well, let me stay there, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about cyber, too, because it seems like I've talked to some experts this week. They seem to be genuinely concerned about that. But let's stick with ISIS. Uh, these reports out of Belgium that you could have basically people infiltrated, become workers inside these plants. Um, in fact, some of the reports I've read, some of these people may have been screened beforehand, they were not radicalized, then they're working there, and then they are radicalized. That seems like a whole new ball of wax. How do you combat against that? Because I imagine you can have the firewall coming in, preventing people from getting a job, but once they're on, employed, you know, how, do you, how do you prevent against that? Well, you've put your finger on a very difficult problem. There are documented cases in which people have been radicalized in less than a year. Typically, the uh, r review of security clearances occurs on a several year basis. So it would be inside of that window and difficult to screen against. So it takes really constant vigilance on the part of the colleagues of the individual to see if there's any change in behavior that would indicate a uh, move toward radical or terrorist um, tendencies. Let's say I'm working alongside you, uh, I can keep my eye on you, and yet one of the things uh, is, is cybersecurity. I was talking to somebody the other day, they said, you know, you could have something there and not even know it, and it could be there, and suddenly the, the attack happens maybe two, three years later. Uh, this is a genuine concern for folks, isn't it? Sure. Cybersecurity obviously can affect all elements of society, and there's no reason why the nuclear realm would be immune from those concerns. And so it is a significant concern. And when paired with either an outside attack or some sort of physical attack on the inside, it can be even more insidious. Uh, Will, we're talking a lot here about China and the United States, their cooperation. It's interesting, you look at these major powers, but then you have other countries where they may have different systems in place. Um, in fact, I was talking to an expert the other day. I said it's, it's basically an alphabet soup when it comes to security, uh, the, the different controls and environments. Um, how do you get everybody on the same page? Well, that's exactly, I think, one of the great deficiencies. I think the major nuclear powers, at the very least, uh, certainly the permanent five members of the Security Council that hold nuclear weapons, should agree on a standard uh, of what is effective nuclear security. You mentioned Belgium. Until very recently, Belgium didn't even require armed guards at the, its facilities that held weapons-grade material. The other issue, though, is each one of these countries have their own sovereign laws. Uh, how do you get them on board there? And then the other thing is, is budgets, too. Uh, some people don't see this, perhaps, as a concern, uh, budget-wise, or they don't have the money. Well, sovereignty is, is clearly an issue, and the responsibility for nuclear security exists at the state level. States are responsible for their own nuclear security. But I think it's important that the principal nuclear states agree to a minimum level of effective security. It has to be voluntary. It can't be mandatory or imposed by anyone else. So it, it must be agreed. With respect to budgets, um, I would argue that nuclear security is a relatively modest cost relative especially to the potential costs of nuclear terrorism. How much is riding on this? As, as uh, Nathan points out, uh, this was the U.S. president's baby in 2009. He unveiled it. There's been four of them. Uh, how much is riding on this for the, for the U.S. president? Well, I think the, uh, the, in terms of where the process goes from here, the leaders are contemplating a series of statements that would provide um, support and mandates for international organizations such as the International Atomic Energy Agency, Interpol, and others. 
uh, that would essentially describe a game plan for them to carry on the work of the summits. I personally believe that it would also be very important to leaders to, for leaders to cement their understanding that nuclear security is an undelegatable responsibility of the heads of government or heads of state. This is not something they can push off on a subordinate. It remains their responsibility. And as long as they recognize that, then I think that there will be effective action by the other uh, organizations. So when you see people like Hollande and Cameron and President Xi, all of them coming here, uh, Modi, uh, that, that's basically a statement, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. How far along on the, in the process have, have we come in, in the four uh, summits that we've seen? Have you seen a market change? Yes, there, as I mentioned, they, um, there are a dozen countries or so that have removed all of their um, weapons usable material. There have been improvements at uh, further dozens of facilities where they're now more secure. Um, there's improved regulation in many countries and, and regulatory oversight. Um, things are much better than they were. One uh, particular example is um, the the growth of the World Institute for Nuclear Security, which promotes the sharing and use of best practices in nuclear security among those responsible for fissile material. They've launched an academy to train people to make sure that there is um, a, an objectively competent demonstration of, uh, uh, of uh, abilities uh, by those responsible for nuclear material. You don't need a lot of material to make a dirty bomb, though, do you? Certainly not for a dirty bomb, and, and even the amounts of material that would be necessary for a nuclear weapon are relatively small. The, the quantities that the International Atomic Energy Agency uses are 8 kilograms for plutonium and 25 kilograms for highly enriched uranium as what they call significant quantities. One thing we really haven't talked about is uh, disarmament and nuclear uh, non-proliferation, which are also two key uh, elements to this. Um, the DPRK has been uh, frightening of late uh, with some of the um, saber rattling. Uh, it seems as though the, the world speaking with one voice, uh, the U.S. and China out in front on this uh, with the sanctions. Talk to me about that landscape uh, that we're looking at, because with the P5 plus one, Iran uh, neutralized, uh, it seems as though the DPRK the main concern at this point in time. You're right. North Korea is the primary nonproliferation problem confronting the world at this point. And I actually do believe that China is the key to solving it. It's not a viable state without China's support. And therefore, there's a lot of leverage residing in Beijing. Do you think that the, uh, the six-party talks can resume at any point? I don't know. Um, and if you listen to what the North Koreans are saying, they won't, under any circumstances, give up their nuclear weapons. So I think there, there needs to be a fundamental change in Pyongyang. Uh, before those talks would have any hope of producing progress. And we do know that uh, the U.S. president will be meeting with Park Geun-hye of uh, the Republic of Korea and, of course, Shinzo Abe from Japan. Trilateral talks, undoubtedly, they're going to talk about this. One would suspect that uh, the U.S. president will also bring up this issue with uh, Xi Jinping when they meet at the White House. Certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but do you expect uh, they'll all come out with one voice again? And, and what, what impact does it have? Well, my impression is actually the countries other than the DPRK in Northeast Asia have been moving closer together on this issue. Um, we saw very strong statements from Russia and nearly as strong from China in the wake of the, the North Korean test and the sort of belligerent rhetoric about using nuclear weapons that's co been coming from Pyongyang. It's clear to me that uh, China has much more at stake in the Republic of Korea in the South than it does in the North. There's far more trade, far, uh, far more interests in common than with the DPRK.